Okay, uh, I think we'll get started. Um, welcome to session 4-3, research review and on CI recalls and revisions. Uh, just for the sake of time, we won't be introducing the speakers. They'll just get up in order, introduce themselves, and do their presentations. We do have time for two Q&As in this session. So after the first three speakers, we'll have a Q&A, and then after the next four speakers, we'll have another Q&A. So um, gather your questions. So why don't we get started? Emily, thank you. Okay, good morning. My name is Emily. I'm a second year fellow at NYU, and I'm going to be talking about cochlear implant revision surgery and just a few um, uh, more difficult cases. And here are our disclosures. So as a CI technology and candidacy criteria are evolving very quickly, um, we're continuing to implant more and more patients. And so with that, we may need to perform more and more revisions. And it's anticipated that many uh, children implanted at an early age will eventually require uh, at least one revision during their lifetime. And these cases, I think, can be extremely stressful. Um, sometimes the patients depend quite a bit on that ear. And in high volume centers, uh, it's thought that CI revisions uh, may occur in up to 5 to 15% of cases. And so they're likely to become pretty important part of our practice in the future. So for this study, we identified four potentially challenging situations that a surgeon may be faced with. The first we called legacy device revision, and this refers to essentially uh, an implanted electrode that's no longer available. The second was changes in manufacture, and this may occur um, due to patient wishes and historically would occur for MRI compatibility purposes. The third situation is revisions of short electrodes, and this may occur uh, in patients in whom low frequency hearing is lost. And finally, a fourth situation is the revision of thin pre-curved array revisions where using the same electrode may not be ideal. So our objective was to review uh, two centers experience with revision cochlear implantation in cases where the same electrode was not used and to highlight surgical challenges and outcomes. To do this, we performed a retrospective chart review and revision cases between 2010 and 2021 were evaluated. Overall, we identified 120, 106 revisions, 44% uh, were due to hard failures, 13% soft failures, and 42.5% uh, medical and surgical failures, and 27 of these revisions were performed with a different electrode. So if we look first at the legacy device revision, we had nine patients in this group with a median age of 29 years and a median time between original surgery and revision of 23.5 years. And here we can see speech perception um, at three different time points, in this case CNC words. So we have the best performance prior to revision, the worst prior to revision, and then the best after revision. And we can see that on average, the majority of patients reached their preoperative best scores after revision. More specifically, in six of these patients, they had the original uh, straight electrode by cochlear, and half of them were revised with a contour advance by cochlear and the other uh, with a slim straight electrode. And what we found was if the patients had a full insertion on their first surgery, a full insertion was achieved on their revision, uh, no matter the electrode used. We had two patients that had the Clarion device by AB, and one was revised with a mid-scala electrode and one with a 1J, and both had full insertions. Oh, go back. And finally, we had a patient that had the Combi 40 device with a standard array, and this person was revised uh, with a contour advance electrode. And the reason for choosing that electrode was because on the preoperative x-ray that was done before the revision, it was noted that the original insertion uh, was only a partial insertion. And so the contour advance was uh, used, hoping to make the most of its styletted design. So the challenges we found were really related to the original position of the electrode. So for example, this is a case, and we can see on the left side that um, 
the original electrode is not fully inserted. And when this was the case, uh, upon revision, there was often multiple challenges despite the electrode chosen. And so uh, it was important to counsel patients uh, when the first electrode uh, may not be perfect, it might be difficult to get a full insertion on revision. The second case, uh, the second challenge was when we changed manufacturers, and this occurred in seven patients, eight years, that had a me median age of 39.5 years and a median time between original surgery and revision of 2.5 years. Here, patients did not always achieve their preoperative scores. We had five patients that were part of the AB field recall. Four had a mid-scala electrode, one had a slim J. The four mid-scalas were revised with slim straights by cochlear and one with a contour advance. And then we have the metal uh, situation revised with a contour advance that I discussed previously. And we also had one case of a slim medialar electrode by cochlear that was revised with the Flex 28 by Medel, and this was in the context uh, of MRI compatibility needs. What we found here, uh, although it's a small group of patients, we did have one patient who had a significant decline in performance after switching manufacturers. And this can be multifactorial. This was an older man. It was his second revision. However, it does give us pause uh, learning from his uh, experience. We also found that in these contexts, we had two cases of electrode overinsertion. Um, this is a child who had uh, an MSC by AB and was revised with a slim straight by cochlear. And we can see on the x-ray that it was overinserted and we chose to pull it back. And it makes sense as we are placing a lateral wall electrode into a perimedialar pathway. For short electrode revisions, we had four patients with a median age of 64 years and a median time before, uh, origi between original surgery and revision of five years. Here, the patients regained their preoperative scores uniformly. All patients had the hybrid L24, and two received a slim straight, one a contour advance, and one a mid-scale electrode. And all patients had full insertions after surgery uh, and did very well. And this is just an example of a patient, uh, their, pre their first uh, L24, and then you have a, a slim straight that was placed in this case with a, a nice full insertion. Finally, we had 11 patients that had a, a thin pre-curved array, and their revisions occurred at a median age of 40 years. And once again, uh, on average, patients returned to their baseline uh, from their best preoperative CNC word scores. In this case, uh, we had seven patients that were revised with a contour advance three with a slim straight, and one uh, with a Medel Flex 28. And all patients had full insertions upon revision. So some of the lessons that we learned uh, from revising the, or from reviewing these patients and revising them um, was at, whenever possible, replace like with like. And this is true except for the slim medialar electrode. The second thing we found was the importance of the preoperative radiograph. And essentially, it gave us a lot of information to characterize the configuration of the original placement. And especially, it was useful in terms of patient counseling um, and setting expectations. And then the last point, which I didn't have, uh, for time's sake, didn't speak about very much uh, in the results, but we do always try to have uh, the depth gauge or dummy electrode close by uh, in order to help us make intraoperative decisions, especially in the revision of these legacy devices. Thank you. I'd like to thank the uh, ACIA and my co-authors for giving me the opportunity to pre present our data. My name is Zachary Schwamm. I'm the current Neurotology Fellow at Mount Sinai in New York City. And I'm going to be discussing our institutional experience with cochlear implants falling under the 2020 FDA Voluntary Field Corrective Action. These are our disclosures. 
So in terms of background, in early 2020, just before the pandemic hit, a voluntary field corrective action, or VFCA, was instituted on advanced bionics, high-res ultra, and ultra 3D devices. Device failure was secondary to fluid ingress into the electrode, and an explant rate of less than 0.5% was quoted in the initial FDA announcement. Uh, unfortunately, there's a paucity of peer-reviewed data regarding this issue, although some series and some data are just starting to come out. The objectives of our study were to examine our institutional CI failure rate for the models of interest falling under the FDA corrective action, and we also wanted to ascertain whether or not there was a specific pattern of failure. We performed a retrospective analysis of all patients undergoing cochlear implant, uh, explant with the AB high-res ultra or ultra 3D devices for any reason. And the reasons for failure were categorized as per the 2005 European consensus statement and AAMI reporting guidelines. So they could fall under uh, a hard failure, or device failure, performance decrement or adverse reaction, which is known as a soft failure, and for medical reasons. We collected data regarding patient age, etiology of hearing loss, intraoperative variables, postoperative complications, and reason for explant. We did speech perception testing using CNC and AZ-Bio, and all devices were placed using a standard trans transmastoid facial recess approach. Devices suspected of failure and those with impedance values less than 3.5 kiloohms were identified clinically or by company algorithm to risk stratify patients into high, moderate, or no-risk groups. High and moderate risk groups uh, underwent integrity testing with the company and were explanted at the surgeon and patient discretion. In total, we had 90 CIs uh, falling under the voluntary field corrective action. Our total explant rate for these models was uh, 20%. We had 11 pediatric and seven adult cases. Uh, the hard device failures were, there were 15 of them and that was 16.7% and our medical failure rate was just over 3%. We had zero soft failures, and important to note is we had no trauma, no patients experienced any trauma before any of their failures. The mean age at implantation was just over 30 years old, although the range was quite wide at about seven months to 86 years. Uh, the two most common etiologies of hearing loss were progressive sensory neural and congenital idiopathic sensory neural hearing loss. And the mean time to integrity testing was about two and a half years or 30 months although the range was between eight and 61 months. Looking at our 15 device failures, we had seven mid-scalar and eight Slim J electrodes, all had complete insertions at the time of their initial surgery and there were no intraoperative complications. Uh, we took a round window approach in 11 out of 15, an extended round window in three, and a cochleostomy in just one. Intraoperative x-ray confirmed placement at the end of every case. 14 out of 15 had successful initial activation and benefit. Seven of them had lack of expected progress. Eight had a sudden decline. And five out of 15 also had uh, low impedance profiles. Uh, when looking at the final failure reports, electrodes 9 through 16 were the ones most often defunct. In those who went reimplantation, uh, 12 got reimplanted with electrodes of the same company. One opted not to reimplant uh, due to presence of a working contralateral implant, one switched companies, and one is awaiting explant. We had three medical failures uh, in two patients. One had migration of the receiver stimulator causing discomfort, and one patient who had bilateral implants uh, had an initial difficult insertion with some extracochlear electrodes that further migrated. Upon reimplantation with another company, uh, we achieved full bilateral insertion, and that patient's doing quite well. Uh, all reimplanted patients are currently receiving benefit from their new devices. So our failure rate at 16.7% for the heart failures is uh, significantly higher than the initial uh, rate quoted in the FDA notice of 0.5% or less. And this is very similar to what happened with the cochlear nucleus 512. Um, before the official recall, the uh, Public rate was 2.4%, and then after the recall, uh, it went up to 25%, and the company maintained an official statistic of 4.2% uh, worldwide. In the literature, device failure ranges typically from 0.6 to 9%, uh, and is the leading cause of failure in the majority of studies. In past series, the time to implant failure is approximately four to six years, and in our series, uh, it was about two and a half. Uh, survival curves, uh, 
looking at the literature for these devices typically plateau after five years. Fluid ingress into the electrode is a, a relatively common problem in terms of device failures. Uh, it also affected the AB Clarion 1.2, the Clarion 2, and the Hi-Res 90K in 2004. And just perusing the literature, other reasons for failure include defective arrays, open electrodes, receiver stimulator malfunction, and crack casings. Our pattern of failure was a little bit different from uh, those of other series. We had more of a gradual decline, whereas others report a sudden or intermittent shutdown. And importantly, uh, all of our device failures are achieving benefit upon reimplantation. So in terms of future directions, we're going to continue to aggressively monitor our at-risk patients, and we would strongly encourage other centers to proactively analyze their own data. Thank you very much. My name is Megan Marsh. I'm the cochlear implant manager at Texas Hearing Institute in Houston, Texas, and I'll be talking about the variability of pediatric cochlear implants and the um, importance of multidisciplinary care. I do not have any disclosures, and I just want to recognize our research team that helped with this presentation. So just as previously uh, mentioned, in February of 2020, Advanced Bionics announced their field action recall of the Ultra um, V1 devices due to fluid ingress. At Texas Hearing Institute, we had 26 total V1 Ultra devices, including six Ultras and 20 Ultra 3D devices. 17 of those devices have been explanted, including one Ultra, 16 Ultra 3Ds, a total of 13 patients, including nine females and four males. Nine right ears and eight left ears were explanted. There were six different surgeons and three different surgery centers or hospitals that implanted the original device. On average, the age of the patient at explantation was six years and five months, and the device age was two years and four months at explantation. This is a retrospective study of pediatric patients that receive audiology services at Texas Hearing Institute. And as a team, we collaborated to look at the different areas that we found of concerns when looking at V1 devices. Once the field action was announced, we um, came up with our own protocol to monitor all of the patients that have V1 devices. And we specifically monitor them at least every three months. And at those three month increments, we are, um, we are testing aided testing, mapping specifically looking at NRI and impedances, De uh, monitoring their speech and language development and having an integrity test completed by an AB representative. And then in March of 2021 to the present day, we are continuing to monitor all of our patients with V1 devices every three months with the um, previously stated protocol with the exception that integrity testing is only completed if there's concerns. At any point that we have a concern of one of our patients, we meet with our cochlear implant team, which includes our surgeons, audiologists, speech language pathologists, and AVTs, educational liaisons, and social workers to discuss the best, case of, um, best course of action for the patient. So of the 26 devices, um, V1 devices that we have at THI, 46% have been explanted and have post-analysis has confirmed a failure. 12% have been explanted and are still awaiting post-analysis testing. 7% were explanted that showed no detection of the fluid ingress at the time of explantation. And 35% have not been explanted with no failure detected at this time. AB has recommended that clinicians monitor three different areas, including NRI, impedances, and abnormal loudness growth of M levels. At THI, we do monitor NRI and impedances, and of the devices that were explanted, we saw 70% had abnormal NRI responses, 76% had abnormal impedance measurements. Um, we do not actually monitor, really, the, or we weren't monitoring the abnormal loudness growth of M levels just due to our, due to our pediatric population. So this is a typical impedance measurements um, that we would see with a V1 device failure. This is the same patient. Um, the top figure shows um, impedance measurements from April of 2021 that show impedances within normal limits. The bottom figure shows measurements at February of 2022, and you can notice electrodes 9 through 16, the impedance measurements have decreased by over 50%, with, uh, and they're at 3 kilo ohms or less. 
I just want to reiterate how important it is for audiologists and clinicians to actually select the impedance tab in the software so you can continuously monitor those electrode impedances over time. And this are, these are NRI responses. They're from two different patients, but the top figure just shows a normal um, NRI response with um, normal growth of the um, stimulus. The bottom um, shows abnormal loudness growth of those NRI responses. And again, it's very important that audiologists are monitoring these measurements and analyzing that information within the software. Of the devices that we had um, explanted, we had 71% with abnormal integrity tests. Of that 71%, 30% of those devices actually had at least one normal integrity test before an abnormal response or integrity test was detected. The majority of our abnormal integrity tests had abnormal EFI of the ultra devices. Um, and in order to have an abnormal EFI testing, you have to have at least three electrodes that are below threshold or two electrodes with a cross diagonal pattern. We had three devices that only had one or two electrodes um, that fell below that threshold, and two of those devices were confirmed failure post-analysis. Unfortunately, the last one, the third one, um, was lost and will not have a post-analysis. Um, Advanced Bionics also recommended that clinicians send all of their sound wave files of all V1 patients to them so they could analyze the data once they announced their field action. They were then sent, or clinicians were then sent back a report um, with a high match for concern, moderate match for concern, or that there was not enough information to analyze the information. Of the 17 devices that we have explanted, only 29% came back as a higher moderate match of concern, where 59% came back with no concern or not enough information was completed at the time to be analyzed. So of the 17 devices that we had, we um, saw 82% of them had abnormal aided detection thresholds pre-explantation. So this graph shows the average change or the change from pre to post explantation of aided detection thresholds. The dark blue line is the average pre-explantation detection thresholds and the light blue line is the average um, post explantation aided detection thresholds. And there was a statistical difference at all frequency tested from pre to post aided detection thresholds. On average, we had a 32% increase in word recognition scores. Um, each individual was tested with the same speech stimulus at the same intensity level, and post explanted testing was completed approximately three months po um, after they were re implanted. And we see that there was a significant statistical improvement in word recognition from pre to post explantation. So the Autumn 2021 AB Reliability Report indicated that Ultra um, devices had an 84% survival rate at four years, and the Ultra 3D had a 91% survival rate at two and a half years. According to our failure rate, we see that at 15 months, we um, do not have any detection of failed devices, and where at 45 months, our survival probability is at 30%. We also analyzed um, our concerns in our um, data to see if there was any areas that were highly predictive of a V1 failure. And the areas that were highly predictive were educational and teacher concerns, aided detection thresholds, parent concerns, and impedances. Areas of moderate predictability were integrity testing, NRI, and link sound identification. Areas that showed low or no predictability of a V1 device failure was aided word recognition, sound wave analysis, ling sound de uh, detection, and data logging. So in conclusion, there are a number of different variables to be considered when looking at a V1 device failure. It is imperative that audiologists, speech pathologists, AVTs, surgeons, teachers, and parents are all working together to determine concerns and follow-up recommendations for all V1 pediatric patients. I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage every single person to be monitoring um, very strictly all of the V1 devices. In a pediatric population, we know time is of the essence. And so the good thing is that all of our patients that were explained and reimplanted with a new device were showing improvement or have shown improvements. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you. We've got a few minutes for some questions. There are microphones up on the left and the right in the center portion of the room. If anybody has any questions, please uh, please come up to the microphone. Hi, uh, Ken Lee from uh, UT Southwestern in Dallas. I got a question for Emily. Uh, enjoyed your presentation. We recently published our uh, results on the first uh, 834 pediatric implants at, at our center, and we had 33 revision surgeries, seven of which um, were a second revision. And so I, I agree with your, your uh, conclusion that it's best to replace like for like. Interestingly enough that we found that 12% of the original revisions, the families selected to go with the same device, but more than half, 57% of the second revision switched to a different uh, company. And so, you know, at our center, as I'm sure most, we always allow the families to kind of select the device that they choose uh, with a cochlear implant. When they have a second revision, it seems that there is some distrust of the company and they want to move to a different device. Um, how do you approach that knowing that, you know, from a, you know, from a certain standpoint, it's best to go with the same device for the same electrode? I think uh, pretty similar to what you said, we give them the option. And since it is a rare situation, you know, we tell them the data that we have. Um, there are instances of some of the children that I didn't present that were revised uh, with a different manufacturer and did great. So we cannot tell them with 100% certainty, you know, that it'll be a bad outcome. But I think we can give them the information we have and say that there are a few patients who experience significant declines and they just should be aware of it. Uh, I'm Chad Ruffin, a surgeon from Seattle. Um, so every study that I have seen in showing outcomes after revision has used speech perception and quiet. Are you aware of any that have used noise? Because I don't think that uh, performance after revision is, as reported in the literature, is accurate because I know many people who have had revisions and report declines in their performance and noise. Anybody want to comment on the first three speakers? I can just comment that my last talk is going to be exactly the same as there too, but I do have noise data to include, so I can't add that. <laughs> Perfect. I was just curious um, from the experience of the panel, uh, how quickly you see your patients catching up to their old scores or surpassing their old scores? Because I've seen in some cases it's almost on activation day but I would love to hear your experiences. I can answer that a little bit. And from our end, um, I mean, I have one patient that has in, um, in a month's time yeah. far surpassed. I mean, he went from 0% word recognition to 64%. So um, some have taken a little bit longer. Um, I think it also depends on how long they had a failed device, um, potentially, and we're having those concerns. Um, but yes, if we can catch it early and get them explanted re-implanted, we've seen them have really good responses early on. Thank the you. Same results. I have a question for Zach. <clears throat> Actually, two questions. Let's say you have a pediatric patient uh, who has at-risk devices on both sides. <clears throat> One's failed, needs to be explanted. And the parents tell you, well, while you're there, why don't you just explant the other at-risk device. Let's just get it over with rather than have the second surgery a year from now or something like that. How would you counsel that patient? <clears throat> well, it sounds like at this time there's not quite enough data. And uh, personally, I would have to see a lot more before I could have a, a well-informed discussion about that second side. Anybody else want to comment? Same. Um, I know we've had, we had four patients that were um, had, that did have bilateral device failures. Um, some were at different timings, but we, we strongly encourage them to um, do the surgeries at two different times, just because even if they are failing devices, they were getting some benefit, and especially we had a lot of school-age kids. Um, we did not feel like taking all that sound away at one time was really the best option for them. And all the families did feel that was a good option, and we saw great success with that. A similar question would be, um, and these are real life questions I've been asked, um, you have an at-risk <clears throat> child, it's really convenient to have them explanted over the summer, 
not during school, um, and they just say, look, from what I'm watching the data, the numbers are growing, the percentage are growing, can we just get it over with this summer, even though my device hasn't failed yet? How would you counsel that patient? Yeah, I mean, kind of, I'm somewhat the same. I mean, I think, again, with pediatrics, we need to be moving quickly, um, especially ones that are still developing that speech and language. And if we're missing all that information, there was a lot of these kids had place cue errors. Um, they had limited or no progress with speech and language. So waiting for that time, um, it's not really beneficial for the child. I did have um, one patient that they very much wanted to wait he had spoken language. He was doing well with his um, uh, his opposite ear. So I did kind of, I definitely counseled, but they did want to wait till Christmas break where he had more time for recovery. So I think it, it really depends on each case individually a little bit. I think it's sad that we have done a few of those where we've explained to both of them at the same time, both of them as family for the most part. Um, but we also have access to the microphone. Oh, sorry. We also have access to the AIM system, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit, but we've actually ran, we ran the EFI analysis in the operating room just before the case because we know how quickly this situation is evolving to see if we can kind of make a last minute decision about the choice of both. I have been impressed that um, Advanced Phonics has been, in those families that wanted both replaced, you know, they talked to their administration and lawyers, and whatever, and they've actually supported that. Uh, if if the families really wanted to be done, so. Okay, I think we're a little bit ahead of time, but why don't we move on to the next speaker, please. Hi everyone, uh, good morning. My name is Ariana. I'm a PGY1 at NYU. Um, and today I'll be talking about electrode position and clinical outcomes in revision cochlear implantation at NYU. Um, thank you to the ACIA for allowing me to present uh, and to all of my co-authors who are listed here. Yes. Push the green arrow. Yeah, that's how it's <laughs> Big green arrow. Okay, there we go. Um, here are our disclosures. Okay, um, so revision implantation is overall uncommon, um, but studies looking at major CI centers nationwide have uh, published rates ranging from 4 to 10%. Um, it is overall more common in children, which is thought to be due to higher rates of trauma or post-op infection. Um, and indications for revision have been stratified into three general categories, as has been mentioned. Hard failure, defined as post-explantation testing, um, failure, medical surgical failure, um, or a post-operative complication or improper insertion has caused the failure, um, and soft failure, which is loosely defined as a decline in performance without identified failure on post-explantation testing. Um, overall, patients have shown to perform well, um, but those revised for soft failure uh, do not perform as well as their, um, as their peers. Uh, when a surgeon is revising a patient, they must remove and reinsert the electrode, um, which is nerve-wracking because uh, the idea of causing more cochlear trauma with that process is brought up. Basic science studies of, explant of uh, animal model cochleas have shown that there are higher concentrations of uh, fibrosis in cochleas that have been explanted, as you can see in this figure below. On the left, we have a naive cochlea, and on the right, um, there's an explanted cochlea with higher amounts of collagen. Um, we ideally would like to measure um, if this impacts a revision uh, reinsertion, this uh, fibrosis. So our objectives with our study were to report on the characteristics and outcomes um, at our center with revisions, and to compare um, original and revision electrode positioning using angular depth of insertion, which I will um, explain shortly. So to do this study, we looked at all of our uh, cochlear implantation performed over a nine-year period and re reviewed them to find any revision cases, which we defined as any patient who had an original implant that was then explanted and re-implanted with a different device. Um, so this does not include uh, simply explantation or other revision-like surgeries like a washout for an infection or a magnet removal um, to be compatible with an MRI. 
Uh, we then reviewed those cases for overall demographics, outcomes, um, defined at three different time points. Um, first was best prior to revision with their original device. The next would be uh, just prior to revision, so theoretically when they're not performing well. And then finally, their best after revision. And then when available, um, intraoperative x-rays were reviewed um, to calculate the angular depth of insertion, both for original and revision uh, cochlear implantation. Um, when we talk about angular depth of insertion, um, we reference intraoperative x-rays, um, which are a derivative of the cochlear view, um, a methodology looking at x-rays so we can see the entire cochlear array um, within the cochlea on just an x-ray. Uh, that then has been um, extrapolated to develop a system to evaluate positioning in the cochlea, uh, the cochlear coordinate system, um, which places a z-axis through the medialis um, and pl places the zero of an xy coordinate plane at the center of the round window. Using that, we can calculate the angular depth of insertion of the electrode array, um, which I will demonstrate using a clinical image right here. Um, so first, the reader will uh, estimate the location of important anatomic landmarks. Uh, the superior semicircular canal, the vestibule, and the medialis, um, and draw three reference lines. The first reference line is from the superior semicircular canal to the vestibule intersecting at the electrode. The next is from the medialis to intersect um, the electrode and therefore intersecting with that first line. And the intersection of those will estimate the location of the round window. And then the final line is from the medialis to um, the start of the apical electrode. And then those uh, second two lines uh, create an angle that is then added to 360 degrees to give us an entire angular depth of insertion for that array. So moving on to our results, um, we found 109 cases, um, nine of which were discarded, uh, eight because they were simply explanted and not reimplanted, and one who was reimplanted with an ABI. Um, 73 of those patients were implanted at our center within our time um, allotment, so they were eligible for. Uh, inclusion in a center revision rate, which came out to 5.3%. Um, of the overall 100 patients, though, um, the majority of them um, were female. They were about split between adults and children. Um, and the majority of them were revised for heart failure, shortly followed by medical surgical failure and soft failure. Um, notably, 20 of the heart failures were due to the aforementioned um, advanced bionics um, uh, field action. And about 16 of the medical surgical failures were due to uh, infection. Uh, the majority of these patients were originally implanted for bilateral central neural hearing loss due to a variety of indications. 11 of our patients um, underwent a manufacturer switch, and 11 of our patients um, underwent more than one revision. One of them underwent three revisions. Um, our outcomes were based on word recognition score on the implanted side. And we found that overall, our patients performed well. Um, they reached uh, scores that were not significantly different from their baseline, um, both overall and sorted by indication for revision. Uh, and those subjects that I mentioned who were revised with a different manufacturer and also subjects who were revised with a different electrode also had similar outcomes. And here's our data um, for all revisions. Uh, we have the time to revision defined as the time between the original surgery and the revision surgery. Um, that baseline word recognition score, um, pre-revision score, and post-revision scores. And you can see that the patients reach their baseline scores. And then I have those same patients broken up into their indication for revision, um, heart failure, medical, surgical, and soft failure. The heart failure and medical surgical patients um, reach their baseline or surpass them, but the soft failure patients do not, though that is not a significant change. And then for our angular depth of insertion, um, similarly, insertion depths were similar between primary and revision um, cochlear implantation. Um, though all failure subgroups had slightly shallower reinsertions, none of those were significant. Uh, we had nine subjects in our cohort that had reinsertions that were at least 45 degrees shallower than the original, um, but that did not affect their outcomes. And we attempted to correlate the change in outcome from baseline to after revision with the change in angular depth of insertion and did not find any statistically significant correlations. Revision with a different device or electrode also did not impact the depth of reinsertion, um, nor did those 16 patients who were revised for infection. And here uh, is the data. You can see that slightly shallower reinsertion numbers, but as I said, none of these were significant. 
So our takeaways from this project um, were that revision CI is overall infrequent, um, but when it is performed, you do get a similar clinical outcome um, and you do get a similar depth of insertion. And that is true regardless of whether you're revised with a different manufacturer or electrode. Here are my references and thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, my name is Nick Andres, and I'm uh, PGY4 at Johns Hopkins, and I'm going to be uh, discussing outcomes after revision of advanced bionics, Clarion 1.2 uh, cochlear implants. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest. Um, so cochlear implant revision um, for either elective technology upgrade or for device failure is becoming increasingly common as the cohort of cochlear implant, implant recipients continues to age. Um, this is particularly relevant for individuals with older generation implants, um, such as the AB Clarion 1.2, that are no longer compatible with newer external processors. Uh, while there is a rich literature describing outcomes after cochlear implant revision, uh, there are limited reports describing ideologic outcomes after elective cochlear implant replacement. Um, so the objective of this study was to evaluate ideologic outcomes for patients who were initially implanted with an AB Clarion 1.2 internal device and later underwent cochlear implant replacement for either elective technology upgrade or for device failure and then received a later generation AB device. And the primary motivation for doing this was to allow us to better counsel patients with um, older Clarion devices who were considering a revision uh, for the reason of uh, technology upgrade. Uh, so we performed a retrospective chart review at our institution um, looking for both pediatric and adult patients who received a Clarion implant and then later underwent a revision uh, for either elective, elective technology upgrade or for device failure. People, uh, individuals who had revisions for other reasons were excluded. Uh, we then collected pre and post uh, revision speech perception scores using AZ Bio, CNC Word, and Hint um, in the quiet condition for the tested ear. And we also collected pure tone averages and then compared these um, with either Wilcox and rank sum test for non-normal variables and a student's t-test for normally distributed variables. Um, this table describes our patient cohort. Uh, we were able to identify 48 uh, unique individuals, uh, of which 35% were male and 60% had prelingual onset of deafness and 40% postlingual. Uh, the mean age at revision uh, was 37 years with a wide range of 4 to 91 years. 54%, uh, uh, 26 of these individuals had device failure, while the other 46%, or 22 individuals, um, elected to undergo revision surgery. 75% um, of these individuals were upgraded to a high-res 90K Advantage device. The other 25% uh, received a high-res Ultra 3D device. Um, a full electrode in insertion was obtained for all patients uh, via a cochleostomy. Uh, so this table, uh, this figure describes the audiologic outcomes for these individuals. So on the x-axis, you have speech perception scores and the quiet condition for the implanted ear. So you have AZ Bio, CNC Word, and Hint, with the uh, black dots corresponding to the pre-revision values and the um, gray dots corresponding to the post-revision values. Uh, when we performed statistical analysis, there was not a significant difference between pre- and post-revision outcomes uh, for any of these three speech perception tests. Uh, and that persisted when we did a subgroup analysis, specifically, specifically looking at individuals who underwent elective uh, revision. And the other thing you can note from this is, is there is some variability in outcomes. There were eight individuals who had uh, a greater than 5% decline in at least one audiologic test. Uh, in seven of those individuals, there was not a clear reason for that. Uh, one individual had a post-revision uh, soft tissue infection that uh, improved with oral antibiotics. Uh, here you have pure tone averages, uh, pre- and post-revision. Uh, an important difference here on the y-axis, a lower score corresponds to a better outcome. 
So you can see there was a slight improvement in pure tone average uh, post cochlear implant revision. Uh, these three graphs show the data in a different way. These are speech perception scores. Uh, on the far left, you have AZ Bio. On the middle, CNC Word. And then on the right, you have Hint. Uh, on the X axis is the pre revision score. And then on the Y axis is the post revision score. Uh, the red line corresponds to the X equals Y line. So a dot on the red line would correspond to no change uh, following revision, where a dot above the line would be an improvement. And then we also have plotted the uh, regression, in a, regression line with the 95% confidence interval. Uh, so you can see here most of the scores are uh, close to the mean with some overlap of the 95% confidence interval with the x equals y line, which would signify uh, no significant change. Um, so our conclusions from this analysis were, um, as a whole, audiologic outcomes remain stable. After re revision of AB Clarion 1.2 devices, although there is some uh, patient level variability, um, elective cochlear implant replacement is a reasonable option for patients with Clarion 1.2 um, cochlear implants who desire compatibility with newer external processors. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, collaborators on this project and uh, thank you for the opportunity. That's not the right slide set. Um, it's the yeah electro positioning after cochlear implant. Nope. Still, still not it. The next to last one. Yeah. <laughs> It's electro positioning after cochlear reimplantation of same device. That's the one. No. There it is. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Miriam Smetak. I'm a current PGY4 at Vanderbilt University. Um, I want to thank my co-authors uh, and the ACIA for having me here today. Today I'll be talking to you about electrode positioning uh, after reimplantation with uh, the same device. These are our disclosures. Um, as my colleagues up here have so well already outlined, uh, cochlear reimplantation is something we're going to continue to talking about for a long time. Current reimplantation rate is somewhere between 3 and 13 percent, depending on who you ask. Uh, as these revisions become more common, it's important for us to understand how these revisions differ from initial implantations. There have been few studies that have examined changes in electrode array positioning after revision cochlear implantation. And so this study attempted to measure three key indicators of electrode array positioning after revision surgery um, that have all been well correlated with audiometric outcomes. The first uh, outcome measure we looked at is scalar location. As all of you I'm sure well know, ideally the electrode array should be completely implanted within the scala tympani. A partial or complete insertion into the scala vestibuli leads to worsened audiometric outcomes. The next outcome measure we looked at is mean medialar distance, which is defined as the average distance of each electrode contact to the medialis, and angular insertion depth, which is the maximum angular depth of all electrode contacts. This was a retrospective study looking at a database of patients who received a high-res ultra V1 advanced bionics device that required a revision surgery. Um, those patients that also received an advanced bionics device and had CT imaging obtained immediately post-operatively for both their initial and revision surgeries. And this is something that is um, routinely done at our institution. Overall, we had uh, 22 revisions that we analyzed from 16 individuals. Five were bilateral, seven left, four right. 
Age at implantation ranged from 10 months to 85 years with a mean of 48.5 years. And time to reimplantation was between 77 and 1400 days with an average of 807. We looked at two electrode array types. On the left, the slim J, which is a straight lateral wall electrode array. And on the right, the mid-scale electrode array, which is a pre-curved mid-medialar electrode array. Uh, for analysis, uh, we used those CT scans using uh, previously validated uh, methods. We are able to auto-segment the cochlea to define the anatomy, and then we can register our post-operative CT scans uh, to those, um, to the, the segmentations, uh, which allows us to determine electrode array positioning within the cochlea so that we can have, so that we can automatically calculate scale location, mean medialar distance, and angular insertion depth. So looking at scalar location, uh, on initial implantation, there were 12 mid-scalar electrode arrays that were implanted. Three of 12 of those were translocated on initial surgery, which is right of 25%, which is comparable to what's been reported in the literature. There were 10 slim J's that were implanted on initial surgery, and none of those were translocated. On revision surgery, there were five new translocations. One of them was a slim J that was revised with the same. Two were slim J's that were revised with mid-scala electrodes, and two were mid-scala electrodes that were revised with the same. There was one reversal of translocation, which was a mid-scala electrode that was revised with a slim J. Overall, the uh, rate of translocation on initial surgery for all electrode arrays was 13.6%. The overall translocation rate for all electrode array types on revision surgery was 31.8%. And looking at mid-scala electrodes alone, um, out of the 14 total mid-scala electrodes, that were implanted after revision, six of them were translocated for a rate of 43%. Looking at mean medialar distance, um, the, this graph here on the left uh, shows the absolute value of mean medialar distance at initial and revision surgery for all electrode types. And then on the right side of the graph is the change in mean medialar distance between those two surgeries. So overall, for all electrode types, there was no significant difference in mean medialar distance. Now looking at each electrode array type individually, this is the mid-scale electrodes revised with the same. Again, no significant difference in mean medialar distance. Looking at slim J's revised with the same, again, no significant difference in mean medialar distance. Looking at slim J revised with a mid-scale electrode, there was no significant difference, but I will note that this is a very small sample size, so likely, given you're going from a, a lateral wall electrode to a pre-curved electrode, there, there likely is a difference there. We were just weren't able to measure it. Uh, and then we only had one patient who received a slim J revision from a mid-scale, uh, and so that one patient had a change in mean medialar distance from 0.62 to 1.13 millimeters. Now looking at angular insertion depth, again, similar type of, of graphs here. On the left is the absolute values. On the right is the change in angular insertion depth. Uh, this is for all electrode array types. Um, there was no significant difference in angular insertion depth. Looking at mid-scala revised with the same, again, no significant difference in angular insertion depth. Slim J revised with the same, no significant difference. And Slim J revised with mid-scala, again, no significant difference, but a very small sample size. And then that one patient who got the, the revision with the Slim J went from 450 degrees to 528 degrees. So prior histopathologic studies have suggested that development of fibrooseous tissue in the cochlea may create a sheath which guides or restricts positioning of new electrode arrays, but this is by no means settled. One temporal bone study demonstrated that the tract of the original electrode array does not necessarily determine revision implant positioning. In our cohort, we had five additional translocations that occurred after revision surgery three of which occurred despite using the same electrode array type on initial and revision implantation. 
One translocation was corrected after a patient was revised from a pre-curved to a straight electrode array. There are, there are limitations to this study. Our study size was limited by availability for CT scans for both initial and revision implants. Further studies are really needed to understand the incidence and outcomes of translocation after revision, but I find these findings um, interesting. Future studies will correlate these findings with audiometric outcomes. Again, our sample size is small and we have a very large range of ages, so it's difficult to uh, draw any conclusions from audiometric outcomes with this particular sample. As more implants are performed, revisions are going to become more common. Prior studies have confirmed the safety and efficacy of revision cochlear implantation. Overall, the electric array is going back where it was but it should be noted there are significant variations and outliers to this. All right, and those are my references. Thank you. Holder and I'm the current cochlear implant director at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Thanks for sticking around for yet another talk about the AB revisions. Today I'll be presenting our data on behalf of Nate Lindquist, who's our current Neurotology Fellow and can be with us here at the conference. So Zach and Megan both, like I said, unknowingly gave my entire talk. So I'm gonna skip through just a couple of slides here of things that have already been presented. So we know we're talking about the recent field corrective action from Advanced Bionics. I'm just going to report our failure rates, but also include some speech recognition revision data. So at Vanderbilt, we have implanted 254 unique patients with the Ultra V1 or Ultra V1 3D, um, with a total of 308 devices. So in total, we have experienced a failure rate of 28.6. This was as of April 8, 2022. We know that this is an ever-evolving issue. We did see a little bit higher rate in pediatrics at 36.6 and 25.1% in adults. Our mean time to failure is very similar to the info that um, Zach presented just a moment ago at 2.5 years. Our method of identifying these failures is also very similar to the data that's already been presented, but at our center we do have access to the AIM system or the automatic insertion monitoring system from Advanced Bionics shown here on the right. It's a tablet that allows us, to, um, allows us to measure electrical field imaging to alert us to device failures. We also saw similar data regarding decreased impedances, decrease in performance, change in aid detection, change in NRIs, and change in sound quality. So for those of you that may not be familiar with this AIM system, it's a quick measurement, takes less than 30 seconds to uh, complete, and it produces a result that can be then uploaded into a program created by Advanced Bionics called the EFI Analysis Tool. And that pretty, pretty much provides you a, an immediate <clears throat> result regarding whether or not the electrode is actually affected. And this is the uh, screenshot that it produces here. So in this particular case, Electrodes 10 through 16 are indicated that they are affected by the um, field corrective action. So I'm gonna go on to just a couple more examples of what this patient might look like if you haven't had the pleasure of delivering this news to 88 different patients. Um, but in terms of their CNC word recognition, the same patient had a 30 percentage point drop um, and they also had poor high frequency aided detection as you can see here. Like Megan already presented, um, these are her impedances May 5th of 2021. And then when she came back May 5th of 2022, you can see that those high frequency electrodes uh, impedances had dropped quite a bit. But to the, before we knew about the field corrective action, I think many of us would have looked at both of these impedances and said, looks great. Um, so if you're not in tune to this failure mechanism, I think it can be easy to overlook. And especially if you're not tracking outcomes uh, routinely using recorded materials, I think it could be easily to, easy, easy to look at these different impedances and say they're all valid. So it's important to be looking for impedances less than about 3.2 kilo ohms. So also as previously shown, this was the reliability data provided by Advanced Bionics in the fall of 2021. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the individual numbers, but just gonna show that our failure rates are quite a bit higher than what they reported in fall. 
I don't fault them for this. I think it's an ever, ever moving target. Um, we're seeing more and more failures every day. But for those of you in the audience that might be thinking, oh, I think our failure rates are maybe around five or 10 percent, I'd really encourage you to take a closer look at the impedances and make sure that we're tracking these patients pretty much every time they come in the clinic. So in terms of revision surgery, 64 of these patients have completed revision surgery at this point. 58 of them elected to go with a version two advanced bionics device. Um, two, unfortunately, were implanted with V1 devices prior to knowing about the field corrective action. One elected to go back to a previous generation AV device, two switched to Medel, and one switched to cochlear. And uh, I have data to present on 34 adults who have completed at least three months of post-operative testing. So here, similar to what's been previously presented, I'm going to show best pre-revision, immediate pre-revision, and best uh, post-revision. So the take-home message here is that we did see a significant drop, um, as, as um, shown by the field corrective action there. Um, but fortunately, our patients are doing just as well preoperatively as they are, as they are uh, postoperatively. And uh, thank you to Chad for the plug. We also have some word recognition data here, which also shows a similar trend that they are performing just as well preoperatively as they are postoperatively. So in conclusion, so far we're seeing about a 30 percentage point percentage uh, failure rate so far. In my mind, I don't think we're anywhere close to having a clean point. We're continuing to an analyze this data and finding new failures every day. Uh, mean time to failure for our group was 2.5 years, which seems to be pretty consistent across centers, but the range is five months to five years. So it's going to require ongoing evaluations for these devices until, in my opinion, all of them are replaced, but hopefully, hopefully not. Um, but fortunately, and the bright side is that most of our patients are achieving best pre-revision speech recognition scores within three months of revision. So given the success we've seen, we recommend a low threshold for revision, revision surgeries and just going ahead and um, taking it, um, you know, completing the revisions as, as quickly as possible. Thank you. time for questions. I have a question for the panelists um, and particularly interested in the Hopkins study um, where patients were taking old devices that weren't failing and one thing that uh, maybe it meant Bluetooth thing. Sorry. <clears throat> I was particularly curious about the Hopkins study. The patients that um, opted to or wanted to have a revision implant so they could avail themselves of new technology that might include Bluetoothing or other features of the processors. Um, but I did notice on your graphs that a number, uh, not a number, a few of the patients actually did worse mm -hmm. uh, post-op, significantly worse. Mm -hmm. I didn't see a lot do that much better. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of these patients think that they're going to do better if they get the latest and newest technology. I'm just wondering for the panelists as a whole, how might you counsel a patient that comes to you saying, I want the latest advanced bionics device because I want the Marvel processor and all its features? What mm -hmm. might you say to that patient? Yeah, I'll at least say in, in regards to the, to the Hopkins study, um, so the way that we've been counseling patients is we would expect audiologic outcomes to likely remain stable, but there is that roughly 20% chance that there could be some decline in speech perception scores. So we haven't been describing that uh, in a way that would make them expect a improvement in function. Um, but since we did perform this analysis, we have offered this to probably a few more patients than we were uh, beforehand. Jordan, you're in a very busy center, and you probably encountered mm -hmm. this over the years. What, what would you tell a patient? Would you discourage them from doing this? Uh, I mean, I guess there's an issue of paying for it. I mean, how do you get insurance to pay for a non-failed device because of new technology? Do you tell them you're going to do so much better? I mean, that's what insurance companies want to hear, that you're going to offer them something they're going to do so much better with, but it doesn't seem that they do. Actually, myself don't have a lot of experience with replacing that particular device, but I think one thing we have to think about is just the accessibility of having a processor that works that they can wear. Um, so at some point, I think you have to think about updating the technology to make sure that they have an external processor that's functional and reliable. So even though they might not, you know, increase their performance, having a device that's a little bit more, bit more robust and 
Thank you. I have a question for Dr. Andreessen. Um, there, the Clarion 1.2 uh, was part of a series where uh, AB had the positioner device, and I was wondering, uh, that thing requires like a two millimeter cocleostomy to get that thing in. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you did a subgroup analysis on that or to explain why some people may have decreased their scores. Uh, in, in terms of a subgroup analysis for those with the positioner device? Yes. Uh, n we did not uh, perform that specific subgroup analysis, but I think that's, um, that's a, a good point and something uh, we'll look back at. Um, hello, my name is Connor Sullivan. I'm an audiologist at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, I wanted to thank Dr. Holder for your um, wonderful data. Um, I'm glad to see that um, you guys are being really proactive in finding those V1 cases. Um, and I'm also glad to see that the V2 cases seem to be bouncing back. My big question was is um, on those V2 cases, are you testing them with the Q90 processor or because I know in some cases they're offering the Marvel processor. Which one have you guys been using for that? So I think the data that we presented is a mix. Uh, initially, at least for our center, we were not getting Marvel processors for everyone, so I think there could be some, some mix in there. But in general, I think today, all of these would be Marvel processors. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. I would say that's a huge advantage, too, that ABS provided, giving these Marvel processors to yeah. patients. Thank you. Hello, Marcus Dam from uh, Melbourne, Australia. Um, I think the reality is that we've got more and more failures, um, and at some stage we have to ask ourselves where is the limit when we use, uh, lose the confidence in one manufacturer. You know, for me it would be if the second of the same uh, uh, implant would fail, I would probably advise the, the patient to go for, for a different brand. But the fact is all manufacturers had device failure, and there are other factors like elective uh, 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 surgery, like you mentioned, Tom, uh, that the people choose to have a better better process and things uh, 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 done for this. So we will have more numbers. For me as a surgeon, the, the, uh, what we can do is A, what we can do different, the decision we can make is uh, her implant selection or manufacturer selection. The second one is, is basically uh, um, just to minimize or to make work easier for the revision. And I think that's something we should discuss. For me it means try to limit the insertion trauma and the trauma we, we create in the cochlea and um, whether it's the selection of, of entry point or whether we flush it or, or whatever we do. Um, uh, my question to you or the surgeon or the panelist, do you agree with that and what would be the measures you would uh, uh, use to do that? Um, that's a very good point, Marcus, and something that I think the field in general is becoming more and more aware of. If one looks back into the 80s at the surgical manuals, almost every cocleostomy at that time, we weren't doing round window, was right into the scale of the stimuli. So my contention was if we could go back and uh, examine all those patients, we probably have a greater than 90% scale of the stimuli insertion. In those days, maybe it didn't matter because they were all very, very dead ears and they got something. Um, so you can't put a a, a new device into the scale of tympani in someone that has a 20-year-old or 30-year-old implant that was in the scale of the stimuli. There's too much fibrosis and scarring. It has to go back where it comes. So your point is absolutely well taken that it's very imperative that we do the best possible job we can the first time around so that all future electrodes end up in the same place. I think the, the one comment I would make from the, the Hopkins case series is at our institution, Around the year 2012, we switched from a cocleostomy insertion to a round window or extended round window. Um, and so in the case series that I presented, all of those patients um, had a cocleostomy, and I think all of them had the positioner device. So I would have to go back um, and look at that. But it would be interesting to see how outcomes after, you know, an elective replacement might be different for an individual with a newer device that was placed via um, extended round window. Because you, you could imagine it's being placed differently in the cochlea, so I don't know. Hello, Joachim Müller from Munich in Germany. I have a question and a comment. First, a question to all of the speakers, especially the last one. You have shown decline in single patient curves. Did anybody of you look at the distribution functions in your patient group? How many improve, how many are in the same level, or how many decrease? And the comment is to Thomas, I apologize. 
but only in the, in the early 90s or late 80s we were able to do cochleostomy entering scalar tympani. There were surgical techniques available, so not every cochleostomy ended up in scalar vesicule. You can argue about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that that comes. I can comment on the first part. All of our patients uh, met or exceeded uh, pre-revision performance except for four at the three-month time period. And three of those had data logging that was less than five hours a day. So the, the three out of four that did not exceed their improvement or exceed, the, exceed their um, <laughs> performance had low data logging. So sorry, I'm, I'm not a native English speaker, but that was not the intention of my, my question, oh, how, many, how long the patient used the devices. But uh, if you look at the distribution function of your patient group, uh, then you can plot the distribution function. You see how, what is the percentage of patients doing worse, doing equal, or doing better. Right, That's so what I was, we I was did, saying for only, four, only four did, did worse than pre-revision. And three out of four of those, we okay. think, were because they weren't using their device. Thank you. Hi, Dan Jathanimus from NYU. I had a question for Dr. Smitak um, and a comment. I guess I think that um, your study and some of ours show that there is quite a bit of malleability, and we're worried about fibrosis, but certainly the electrode can be in a different position, so that allays some of the concerns. Um, and then my question was really just about the one patient, which I know is a single patient, who had a slim J after the MSE, and that seemed like a quite a deep insertion, which is similar to the one that we presented where we pulled it back. I was just curious if you knew the outcomes on that patient, if they wind up adapting very well, um, or if there's any consideration that you're missing portions of the basal turn there. That's a good question. I actually do happen to know that patient's um, outcome was worse than um, their initial implant. Um, I don't know their data logging, so I actually don't know which one of those four it is, but um, that patient did have a worsening of their, their outcome. I'm not sure if that's because, I have several theories about that. It may be because it's over-inserted, but also um, it's clearly in a different tract than the original implant, and so fibrosis, neural locking, there's a lot of things that I think can contribute to a poorer outcome in that case. That's it. Okay. Well, thanks very much. Thanks to the speakers for excellent presentations. Thank you. Thank you.